uh, welcome to Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Si Shang, Tobacco Control Researcher at the Ohio State University. Tops is being organized by myself, Mike Pisco from Georgia State University, Catherine McLean from Temple University, and Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from those questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. New to TOPS this week, we will do a trial run of allowing questions to be posted either publicly or privately. Publicly posted questions may be discussed by the presenter, the presenter's co-author, and others. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to research being discussed. Public posts that are not particularly germane to the research questions will be dismissed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read a lot. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pasco from Georgia State University to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. Scott Hilpern will be leading a grand rounds presentation entitled Leveraging Loss Aversion and Present Bias to Improve Incentives for Smoking Cessation. Dr. Hilpern is a pulmonary and critical care medicine doctor an epidemiologist and a specialist in medical ethics. Among other roles, he is a member of the steering committee of the Center for Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics, he is the John M. Eisenberg Professor of Medicine, Epidemiology, and Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine. He is currently PI of an $11 million PCORI grant studying smoking cessation interventions among underserved populations. He has published more than 250 peer reviewed journal articles. We are also joined by Scott Hilpern's co-author for several of the research projects, Dr. Kevin Bolt, who is a distinguished professor of medicine in medical ethics and policy, also at the Perlman School of Medicine. Our discussant today is Justin White. Dr. Hilpern will be presenting on his research in three segments. We will have pauses after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Hilpern, thank you for presenting for us today. Well, thank you all uh, for the gracious invitation and the introduction. Uh, really happy to have uh, my close friend and colleague Kevin Volk join uh, for this session. And uh, I'll be walking through slides uh, and we can have answers to questions provided uh, either by Kevin or I. Um, just by way of disclosure, uh, all of the work I'm presenting was supported either by the federal government uh, or uh, a grant from the federal government to the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Uh, my other uh, research support is listed here, and of note, I've not received any support uh, from industry of any kind, and particularly the tobacco industry. So uh, the first study I want to uh, discuss with you is a study that uh, Dr. Volk led uh, and was really the, the first uh, landmark study to put the idea of paying people for wellness behaviors uh, on the map. Uh, this was a randomized trial of almost 900 employees at General Electric who were assigned in two groups, uh, one to usual care in which they had access to cessation counseling or to usual care plus a bundle of incentives worth up to $750. And as you can see in the main results slide, the incentive uh, tripled sustained smoking abstinence rates biochemically confirmed uh, out to six months, uh, 5% to effectively 15%. And this uh, led to uh, a, a real uh, sea change in how we thought about smoking cessation. A, a tripling of cessation rates is larger than we typically had seen in prior trials of smoking cessation interventions uh, at that time in 2009. So for our next project, uh, Kevin and I collaborated and co-led a study where we basically asked the question of whether we 
could go beyond thinking that uh, grounded in traditional economics, that paying people to do something will change their behavior. And could we deliver dollars in different ways that might make them more effective? And this study, which was published in 2015, was a five-arm randomized trial among 2,500 employees of a different company, CBS Health, in which usual care was access to information about smoking cessation information. Uh, I'm sorry, access, access to information about the benefits of smoking cessation, as well as uh, access to nicotine replacement and behavioral counseling through the corporate wellness benefits programs available. In an accompanying editorial, uh, Cass Sunstein, the author of Nudge, uh, noted that one of the things that we sought to address in this study was the importance of loss aversion and, and making pre-commitments to certain contracts to augment the power of incentives. And I'm gonna describe to you in the next slide what the intervention arms looked like. So this is a bit of a complicated slide. It appeared in the appendix of our uh, publication, but I'll, I'll walk you through it in an effort to uh, ground you in what this study really did. So um, the first thing to note is that we uh, considered people a success in having quit smoking if they had negative uh, biochemical assays for cotinine or anabasine at day 14, day 30, and day 180 after their pre-selected target quit date. Patients in all arms got uh, monetary compensation, which I'll distinguish from incentives, at each of those time points for completing surveys and for submitting their biochemical samples, their uh, typically uh, saliva. We then assessed for relapse at 12 months, the primary outcome was at six months, relapse was assessed at 12 months after the incentives had been turned off. And now the way in which the four arm incentive arms differed was that two were oriented towards individuals and two were oriented towards groups of six people who were paired by the investigators. And in one of the individual arms and in one of the group arms, rewards were purely that. We paid people for succeeding. Whereas in one of, in the other of the individual arms and the other of the group arms, we used the concept of deposit contracts where people had to first deposit $150 of their own money into an account that was then held by the research team as a bet on themselves that they would then succeed. And if they did, they got that $150 back plus additional uh, matching funds. And the way in which this works specifically is the individual rewards, they got $200 at day 14. If they were still quit at day 30, another $200. If they were still quit at six months, they got not only another $200, but then also a $200 bonus payment for a total of $800. In the collaborative rewards arm, again, they don't make any deposit at the outset, but the amount that they got paid at each time point varied as a function of the number of people in their group who succeeded. Uh, this was an attempt to build on the spirit of collaboration and people in these groups were actually linked together through a Facebook style chat room. So they could, in theory, uh, motivate each other to do better. The more people who succeeded in a group, the more money each member who succeeded received. So they could, in theory, receive much more money in that collaborative rewards arm, although in actuality, the realized payments across all four arms was uh, identical among those who succeeded. The individual deposits I basically described before, they made $150 uh, down payment on themselves, typically by credit card. And then if they succeeded, they got that 150 back plus an additional 650 or up to an additional 650 if they made it through six months. And then the competitive deposits arm is really the analog, it sort of can be thought of as combining the collaborative rewards arm with the individual deposits. Everyone makes a deposit, 
But now, instead of building on principles of collaboration, we built on principles of competition, that everyone wants to do better than their peers. And so the fewer numbers in a group of six who succeeded, the more money that went to each person who did. So the first finding of this study uh, was not unexpected entirely, although we were surprised by the magnitude of the finding. So we might imagine that people are more loath to sign up for a contract in which they have to first put 150 bucks down. And indeed, that is what we found. If you look at the two deposit contract arms together, it was about 14% of people were willing to do it. Um, and about 90% of people who in the peer reward arms uh, truly engaged with their assigned intervention, meaning that they had shown some sign of accepting the contract. So that was a big difference. We had expected there to be some difference and in fact had designed the, the trial intentionally to account for this in a uh, thought piece that Kevin and I and our colleague David Ash wrote in the British Medical Journal. We had laid out this conceptual model where the overall population level effectiveness of any intervention is the product of how many people agree to use the intervention times its conditional efficacy, which is to say how well it works among those who use it. So a deficit in uptake would need to be counterbalanced by extremely high efficacy in order to yield comparable population level effectiveness compared to uh, an intervention that's much more acceptable, uh, even uh, while it might be less efficacious. And so uh, our primary results are shown here, and these uh, basically blend together those two concepts of uptake and efficacy. And what you can see is that our, our primary time point at six months, all four intervention arms were superior to usual care. If you look at the reward arms, you again see a very similar rate of tripling of cessation rates that Kevin had demonstrated in the 2009 paper, a uh, study conducted with GE. Uh, again, about 15% versus about 5%. Um, if you look at the reward arms versus the deposit arms, you see that the rewards overall did better, that the success rate was intermediate between usual care and rewards for the deposit arms. And because of the data I showed you previously about the low rates of uptake of the deposit arms, you're probably, wheels are already turning and you're imagining, hmm, the efficacy among those who took it up must have been pretty high to get a population level effectiveness of 10.2%, of and indeed you'd be right. Among that 14% who used deposit contracts, the success rates were roughly 60 to 65%. But that's not a really fair comparison because that's picking people who were not, who were, uh, who could be selected by virtue of being more motivated to quit. So to account for that selection effect that a traditional per protocol analysis would have, or as treated analysis would have done, um, we use a method called complier average treatment effects where we model the randomization arm as an instrumental variable to account for differences in uptake and then use methods of principal stratification to identify people who would have accepted uh, deposits if they had been offered them. So there are some of those people in all of the arms, but only in some of the arms were the deposits actually used. And in that analysis, we find that the specific efficacy of deposits, again, confined to people who would have accepted them, was about double uh, what the reward-based in incentives were. So to put this together, you can conclude that from an overall population uh, effectiveness level, rewards ought to be preferred to deposit contracts. But if we could identify people who would accept deposit contracts, we definitely should be tailoring uh, our incentive programs towards those people because loss aversion really does, or building on loss aversion, people's desire not to lose that $150 really does work. How did we sort of 
put those two seemingly conflicting bits of uh, policy guidance together when we had subsequent conversations with CVS, well, we uh, basically wound up, Kevin and I wound up recommending to CVS that they reduce the pre-commitment uh, amount from $150. And what they ultimately settled on when they put this into practice uh, was a $50 upfront payment. And uh, they rolled that out among all their employees for the next several years. The next trial we did uh, sought to do several things. Um, first, it, and most importantly, it sought to overcome uh, a, a limitation of every other trial that we and essentially everyone else had ever done, which is that by requiring prospective consent to participate, we are de facto selecting for a motivated population of smokers, people who truly want to quit. And although that's an important question, uh, from a policy perspective, at least in the context of workplace wellness programs, it's not really the right question or the most relevant one for the employer. The employer wants to know, if I roll this out among all people, it's got to be eligible to everyone, regardless of their motivation. Otherwise, it would be inequitable. So how well will it work and what's the return on my investment for rolling this out across the entire uh, population of my employees who smoke? So the first innovation of this trial was uh, we used an opt-out form of, of consent where people were enrolled unless they specifically opt out, opted out, and I'll show you the data on that in a moment. The second is we were getting interested in the benefits of e-cigarettes. So we incorporated free e-cigarettes into uh, this study. The third is that in our prior studies and most other prior studies, uh, there was access to nicotine replacement therapy, but also good evidence that particularly varenicline, if not also bupropion, are more effective than nicotine replacement therapy when you get a prescription for them. So we wanted to build in uh, pharmacologic support in the, and test the effects of incentives in the context of that pharmacologic support. And then finally, we wanted to go the next step in trying to see if we could leverage gloss aversion without the barrier of an upfront uh, money down contract. And we did this by trying to uh, message uh, a deposit contract in a way that people are told that there is a pre-funded amount of money being held in a bank in their name, but they don't actually have to contribute to that account, but that every when they fail to quit, that money is then removed and they don't get it and they do get it if they do quit. So it's there for them. It, we tried to make it feel like it was theirs, but they didn't actually contribute to it. So this, uh, just to reiterate mostly what I've uh, just said quickly, uh, 6,100 uh, known smokers at 54 companies across the US uh, who had been identified on health risk assessments the year before were enrolled. 2% uh, or 125 opted out from the trial. So we wound up uh, with a total sample of uh, 6,006 people. Those 6,006 were randomized to five arms, uh, which I'll actually describe uh, in more detail in the next slide. So the usual care arm was just the basic wellness program being offered across these 54 companies uh, where they got uh, whatever benefits their employee uh, or employer was offering, plus tailored email messaging uh, encouraging them to quit smoking. The second arm got uh, all of that plus free access. And I, I should say that, uh, uh, well, you know, actually I'll just go to the arms. So the second arm got all of that plus free access to e-cigarettes. Um, these were Enjoy products, which were donated uh, and uh, were first generation uh, products donated by uh, that company to be used in the context of this trial. And uh, 
they could order them directly through uh, the, the program's website uh, as they saw fit. The third arm uh, got uh, the basic program plus free choice of nicotine replacement therapy, varenicline, uh, or bupropion. And if they failed uh, to quit smoking with their initially preferred therapy, they could then choose uh, e-cigarettes. And then the fourth and the fifth arms got basically everything in arm three, plus in arm four, they got a straight payment of $600 if they succeeded. And in arm five, they got that virtual pre-funded deposit contract, again, where they didn't have to put down any of their own money, uh, but it was messaged to make them think that it already was theirs for the losing if they failed to quit. Among these 6,000 people, uh, a total of about 1,200 of them engaged with the platform. So again, this is all messaged through email and through text messaging. So they didn't actually have to do anything. This was like 100% on the pragmatic end of the spectrum of trials. And I'll explain what I mean by that in more detail in a moment. Uh, whereas the other 4,800 or so people really never engaged with the trial at all. And we do two sets of analyses. One is the traditional intention to treat analysis where we include people regardless of whether they engaged. And then the other is a uh, sort of as uh, treated analysis or per protocol where we only look at the 1200 or so people who actively engaged with the program. And of course, there were some of those across all five arms. And here's what we see. There were eight pre-specified contrasts. Uh, we adjust significant level, uh, significance levels to preserve an overall alpha level of 0.05 across the entire study. And there were three statistically significant findings. First is that uh, the uh, virtual deposit contracts were statistically superior to free e-cigarettes. The uh, reward-based contracts were statistically superior to free cessation aids. And the uh, uh, deposit contracts were also statistically superior to free cessation aids. There were no statistically significant differences between uh, the reward-based uh, incentives and the virtual deposits, uh, nominal improvements, as you can see, uh, but not statistically significant with the virtual deposit contracts. Free e-cigarettes uh, were no better than usual care, nor were they any better than free cessation aids. And in fact, free cessation aids were no better than usual care either. So uh, what did we find? Well, in answering our question, how successful are workplace smoking cessation programs among all people to whom they are offered, we found not very. Uh, but in a secondary analysis, they were still highly cost effective. How effective are incentives when added to free nicotine replacement therapy and pharmacotherapy? Still tripled quit rates, the same way in which they did in the absence of, of baseline uh, assistance uh, and in the presence of baseline uh, NRT. How effective are free e-cigarettes or free cessation aids either? when added to smoking uh, cessation uh, information without personalized assistance on how to use them, not effective at all. And I've intentionally added that clause without personalized assistance on how to use them because this is one way in which this was truly a pragmatic trial to see how these things would be uh, uh, taken up and how effective they would be in the real world. And this contrasts with what a different study that some of you may be familiar with, led by Peter Hajek and colleagues in the UK, where they found in a study published just last year among about uh, 850 to 900 smokers that delivering uh, free e-cigarettes with a four-week tailored behavioral program coaching people on how to use the e-cigarettes, e-cigarettes were more effective than nicotine replacement therapy in that trial. So the two key differences, 
Here, we're talking about all comers, not selected by their motivation to quit. Whereas in the Hodgett trial, the, those were smokers who were motivated to quit at baseline. And here, we're not providing the personalized assistance, which could augment efficacy for sure, it probably does, but also augments costs of intervention delivery. So I think these two trials are entirely compatible with each other and they present, they answer very different questions. So they're, they're not uh, in, in any way, in my mind at least, in conflict with one another. They're addressing fundamentally different questions that have different level, different policy import. And then finally, do deposit contracts that are funded in advance, our so-called virtual deposit contracts, uh, work better than reward, straight rewards? Uh, unfortunately, they did not. So we'll pause here, uh, be happy to uh, take some questions, comments. I don't know if there's been activity already going on in the chat room. There has, so I, I'll try to ask some of the, um, the questions that are in the, the Q&A, um, but Justin, if you have any uh, discussion comments, um, feel free to uh, go first. Sure, uh, I, I have a, a couple for you. Um, so in the 2015 trial, the two group incentive designs didn't outperform the simpler designs. And I'm wondering whether you think of that finding as particular to the specific group designs you tested or more generally uh, com more complex designs, or do you think that um, you know, uh, complex incentive design schemes are just really not worth the effort, the bang for the buck? Yeah, thanks for that question, Justin. Uh, I think it's a really thoughtful one. Um, I am definitely on the side of that it was, uh, at least our prior should be, that it was uh, particular to the way we deployed and, and formed the groups. So these were people who did not previously know each other. So the group mentality, uh, whether it's in a cooperative framework or a collaborative, uh, I'm sorry, a cooperative or a competitive framework, uh, may not generalize to uh, the comparable types of research that you might imagine where people are put into teams based on uh, pre-existing relationships and friendships. So for example, there have been studies of uh, taking different wards in hospitals and the nursing staffs on those wards and uh, randomly assigning them to these uh, team-based weight loss programs. And these nurses know and have learned to work with each other and they wanted to like show well for their wards and for their teams. And in those settings, uh, group-based uh, incentive programs have worked. So I do think it was uh, a, a I don't wanna say a peculiarity, but, but perhaps could be attributed to the fact that the people in these groups didn't know each other at baseline. Great, one more question. So this week, the New York Times had an article on contingency management, which I think of as an intellectual cousin to your work, maybe. And the Times article argued that a major barrier to offering incentives for abstinence in drug treatment programs is, quote, the moral objections to the idea of rewarding someone to stay off drugs. And I'm wondering what you see as the major barriers to getting payers, in particular like Medicaid, perhaps to reimburse for incentive programs for tobacco cessation, perhaps outside of workplace settings. Yeah, I, so I, I think there are a number of issues and, and I, I know Kevin has some thoughts on this as well. So maybe I'll, I'll provide an initial answer and then see if, if Kevin wants to uh, chime in as well. So um, there, I think there are a couple barriers. Uh, some is that there is aversion to paying people to do something that other people are already doing for free. Uh, some people find that objectionable. I, my counter to that uh, argument is that the people who are uh, not smoking at baseline uh, are already actually paying. They're subsidizing the smokers through higher healthcare premiums for all. And so I, I think that's a bit of a, a myopic opposition. Uh, the second is that I think employers really need to see the cost effectiveness data of these incentive programs to be convinced of their value. Like 
I think I don't think anyone is in disagreement with the idea that, of course, you can promote smoking cessation by paying them now. Uh, thanks, you know, to going all the way back to Kevin's original study, and and there's been Cochrane review supporting this as well. It's just, it's more a matter of the cost effectiveness. In our most recent trial, we do document the cost effectiveness. We also have a cost effectiveness analysis from both the uh, societal perspective as well as the employer perspective from, uh, that was done in the context of that 2015 trial that's, that's not yet published, um, but has some interesting findings. So I, I, those are two among the barriers that, that I've seen. Anything to add, Kevin? Yeah, maybe I'll add two things. One is that the New York Times article talks a bit about morality and, and I think the practical concern of paying drug, uh, drug users or giving them cash and worries they'll spend them on drugs is sort of couched as a moral argument. But I think you could argue a lot of this is really just a question of effectiveness. You know, we know success rates are very low in a lot of drug treatment programs. The literature on contingency management is pretty clear that it's quite effective, uh, even with very challenging addictions. But what's really striking is that those programs really haven't been implemented very widely uh, at all. And I think a lot of it actually is an implementation science challenge where people are uncomfortable with you know, dispensing cash, gift cards, it's not something which clinical health systems are really equipped to do. And then there's the whole issue, set of issues coming back to cost effectiveness of who's actually providing those incentives and is it cost effective from their perspective to do so. Uh, and I think, so even though the academic studies showed very clearly contingency management highly effective, it hasn't translated in practice very well. And I think work directly pushing on some of those, those questions needs to be done. Okay, um, uh, Scott, uh, from the Q&A, um, uh, uh, Kevin has been busy uh, answering uh, many questions, but a few um, outstanding questions. There's been some uh, uh, comments um, about uh, if the Enjoy product, we know that you guys did this study a while ago. Um, there's a lot of newer products available maybe that would be, be more effective. Um, somebody pointed out that the the Hodgick study in England as well, they provided, I think, free starter kits um, rather than um, uh, NGS. And we just curious if you had any any thoughts on if maybe newer generation products might show a different story. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, so, so, uh, in, in our study, there were starter kits as well. It, it wasn't just, you know, people got different uh, packages the first time versus in subsequent reorders. Uh, but it was, it, they were older generation products. And, uh, you know, I think there's some small, mostly observational data to suggest that newer generation products uh, may be superior. Um, but I, I would say the jury's out from the standpoint of what are the effects of uh, free new generation e-cigarettes among all comers without the added cost and uh, resource intensiveness of personalized guidance. I, we just don't have an answer to that question. Um, I, you know, I would also say it, it, it's only one of the relevant questions when it comes to e-cigarettes. Um, the two others, of course, being the direct toxicity of the e-cigarettes, uh, which is increasingly well understood, and the, and the other being uh, the, the penchant for e-cigarettes to promote uh, future combustible cigarette use, particularly among the youth. So those three things really need to be considered in concert from a policy perspective. And as the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine concluded two years ago, only if there is overwhelming evidence of effectiveness of e-cigarettes in reducing adult cessation could it could they possibly be of a net public health benefit okay um and one remaining question before we we move on i know that we're um uh, we're spending a lot of time on this first section you have other sections you want to cover um uh, somebody commented that um uh, uh there was low follow a uh, low level of follow-up at 12 months um very few participants completed self-report assessment um and they were wondering why the follow-up rate uh, may have been so low 
Yeah, astute observation. I, I always try and like slip that one in there and, and hope no one notices, uh, but I couldn't get it past this crowd. So um, as you might imagine, there's a big challenge to following people up after the trial is effectively over. Um, we did, uh, we, we spent a lot of time, it, actually there were, uh, if I remember, maybe three or four rounds of back and forth with the New England Journal about that exact issue and whether um, we were really seeing that, you know, there was high um, recidivism rates. And, and in fact, I don't think we were. We were just failing to follow them up because we only offered them $50 to complete that 12-month assessment. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of, of, of dropout. In our subsequent trials, um, we've doubled down on that. So in a, a study I'll mention next, um, we're using $100 to incentivize uh, the 12-month follow-up time point. But, but that is a problem because they're, they're, they're not getting anything else. Uh, and, and you can understand why, why people uh, may not want to submit another sample. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. All right, so I now want to uh, call some attention to uh, the fact that we really need to, in 2020 and moving forward, pay attention to where the problem of smoking really is. We have made tremendous strides, particularly in the United States over the last 40 years in reducing smoking rates, but the benefits of those reductions have been felt unequally across many demographic groups. On the left, you can see that um, adults who are uh, below the po federal poverty limit are more than two times as likely to smoke as adults who have incomes at twice the poverty limit or higher. And on the right, you can see that although uh, smoking cessation rates have gone down over time among people regardless of their educational status, that there's a real demarcation among those who have no higher educational attainment of high school uh, or graduation or more uh, versus those who have uh, college degrees. And if you look in, you know, the most recent data would suggest, again, that those with uh, college degrees smoke at about one-fifth the rate of those with high school degrees. So those are two enormous disparities. Uh, the, another major disparity, disparity that I had, or I should at least say difference, um, is that uh, people in rural settings are much more likely to smoke than people in urban settings. Uh, there's actually not any fundamental difference in smoking rates among black versus white persons or Hispanic versus non-Hispanic persons. However, there are much uh, greater barriers to access to smoking cessation services among racially and ethnically underserved populations. And so this is where uh, all of our attention, uh, is, or at least a lot of our attention is, is currently focused. We're also motivated um, for the trial I'm going to describe next by this landmark study in the New England Journal of Medicine, which found that following um, uh, patients who have heavy smoking histories defined as 30 packs per day uh, I'm sorry, 30 pack years or more, uh, or who are actively smoking and who are originally, when the study was done, it was 55 years or older, although the, uh, uh, the recommendations have since been liberalized to 50 years or older, uh, following them with serial chest CTs, computed tomography, uh, annually, substantially reduced uh, all-cause mortality and lung cancer-specific mortality. And this uh, 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 was translated into the U.S. Preventive uh, Health Services Task Force uh, recommending reimbursement for annual chest CTs for all persons originally 55 to 80 with a 30-plus pack year history or uh, uh, 
uh, active smokers or uh, who had um, uh, quit within the past 15 years. That's, it's a typo. It should say 30 pack year history, quit within the past 15 years or active smokers. And then the 2020 uh, changes, which I mentioned, liberalized the criteria a bit. Several studies have estimated that um, among those who would meet those eligible, eligibility criteria, more than 50% are actively smoking and uh, more than 50% meet uh, one of the demographic characteristics for whom I described disparities uh, previously, low income, low educational attainment, uh, black, Hispanic, or rural. Medicare began reimbursing for low dose CT screening annually in February of 2015. And in the context of uh, making their policy about this, they said that two things had to happen in order to get for health systems to get reimbursed for doing these screenings. One is there had to be a shared decision-making visit describing the pros and cons of screening because there are some cons, uh, it creates worry. You might find what we call incidental omas, things that uh, look scary on a CT but actually do not represent cancer. Um, uh, but of course, there are mortality benefits as described. And the second requirement is there's got to be quote unquote smoking cessation uh, programs, it, it should really say. But they don't really, Medicare doesn't define what a smoking cessation program uh, ought to be. Uh, and in fact, there's almost no evidence as to what works to promote smoking cessation in this context. And this has led to a lot of consternation. Uh, uh, sites that do lung cancer screenings commonly report that, well, patients aren't interested in what we have to offer. Our staff don't have the time to do this. Uh, we really don't understand if we're getting reimbursed at an adequate rate to pay for any labor intensive or resource intensive smoking cessation program. And, and regardless, we, we actually don't know what works best. Like we've seen all these studies in entirely different uh, patient populations about what works for smoking cessation, but we don't know anything in this particular context. And yet it's important because people who quit during the time of lung cancer screening uh, still derive, you might say, well, they're sort of older to begin with, maybe the benefits of stopping smoking at that point aren't really that substantial, but in fact they are. Uh, you still derive a four year net increase in life expectancy if you quit at the time that you're eligible for lung cancer screening. So this led to an initiative called the SCALE Collaboration, which uh, was funded primarily by the National Cancer Institute with one of eight trials being funded by uh, the VA health system. And these eight trials uh, launched in about 2017, 2018, and they can be summarized as follows. Uh, six of the eight had uh, seven screening sites or fewer. One had 26 sites. The sample size has ranged from about 500 to uh, 1,600 uh, patients. Uh, I, I, I'm using the past tense because they've, they've all launched, but we actually don't know the results of any of these yet, so maybe I should use the present tense. They're all opt-in consent, traditional informed consent trials. So again, they're selecting motivated smokers, not all comers. Uh, very few, uh, in fact, only one is, is intentionally targeting any particular demographic, uh, in this case, black patients who are anticipated to be between 35 and 40 percent of the enrolled sample. Um, and all are testing uh, sort of conventional interventions, ask, advise, refer, behavioral counseling or pharmacologic interventions. None of them are testing incentives uh, or e-cigarettes for that matter. And yet there have been some stakeholder uh, consensus panels that have uh, called attention to the need to test more mobile health applications and in fact, financial incentives. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I guess we can pause for discussion here. That's fine. Okay, um, uh, Justin, do you have any discussion comments? Uh, sure, so. Actually, I, I think I, I, I may have inserted a discussion slide prematurely. If 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 you'd like a little more first, I'm sorry about that. In that case, let's per, let's proceed, and then we'll um, 
uh, Justin can ask his discussion questions in the next section. Okay. Um, so I wanted to uh, first tell you about uh, what this trial is, and this is the Bacori funded trial that, that Mike mentioned at the outset. Um, so here we're uh, enrolling current smokers who have an order for a low dose CT scan, who meet one of those criteria of being underserved, and have their order for a low dose CT scan at one of four health systems. The University of Pennsylvania Health System, which is a six hospital system based in Philadelphia. Kaiser Permanente Northern California, which is, um, I'm sorry, Kaiser Permanente Southern California, uh, which is a 23 or so hospital system, uh, as you'd imagine, in Southern California. Henry Ford, which is based in Detroit, and Geisinger, which is an eight hospital system in uh, predominantly rural Pennsylvania. So patients who meet all of these criteria are eligible. And the four uh, interventions we're testing in this pragmatic trial are traditional ask, advise, refer, which is exactly what it sounds like. Patient comes in for lung cancer screening, you ask them, do you smoke? If they say yes, you advise them to stop and you refer them to whatever resources happen to be available in your local context. And that's the minimum requirement for Medicare reimbursement. Second arm is we add to that free medications. So free varenicline, free bupropion, or, and or free nicotine replacement therapy in combinations. The third arm is that we add to that uh, a bundle of rewards uh, built on the prior study, so about $600 to quit. And then the fourth arm we've added is an effort to make incentives work better, which is by helping people imagine a future self that is both healthier by virtue of having stopped smoking and wealthier by virtue of having uh, accrued the benefits of the incentive program. So let me tell you a bit more about episodic future thinking and its importance for smoking cessation. And, and then after I do, that might be a, a, a time for discussion. So Kevin and I did a, a subgroup analysis of that 2015 trial where we looked at people's uh, temporal discounting slopes. So temporal discounting is probably a concept that, that some but not all uh, in, in this audience are familiar with. But it's the idea that in its most simple form that you delay, or, or I'm sorry, discount future benefits in favor of present ones. It's the phenomenon that can be characterized as impulsiveness and it accounts for why uh, we all want to have the chocolate cake today, but we say we'll have the apple tomorrow. Why we're going to sign up for that gym membership uh, next week, not this week, and things of that nature. And we know that uh, temporal discounting or impulsivity not only uh, accounts for or a lot of the variance in who starts smoking, but we've found that it also explains a lot of the variance in who succeeds when uh, given incentives or other interventions to quit smoking. So here you can see that um, in a reanalysis of that 2015 trial, those with the least temporal discounting uh, quit at about 16% when they were offered incentives, and those with the steepest discounting quit at only about 7% when offered incentives. In um, behavioral lab-based work, it's further been shown that temporal or delayed discounting is a causal mediator between this intervention of episodic future thinking, which I'll describe in a moment, and uh, success in smoking cessation. So the way episodic future thinking works is it's a mobile delivered intervention that helps people imagine a future self that is, as I said, healthier and or wealthier. So the way it works is at the start, people uh, design their own cues. It could be 
you know, I'm imagining myself three months from now and I'm playing with my grandchildren in my daughter's house. We are having a lot of fun and I'm feeling great because I have less breathlessness than I used to uh, when I used to smoke. Or it could be uh, it's 12 months from now and the long awaited uh, marriage of my son has arrived and I'm able to not only be there, but to be around my loved ones uh, without anyone worrying that I smell like smoke or I'm not able to keep up in conversation, those types of things. You generate cues and then those cues are delivered through a mobile health device, a cell phone, through text messaging or a smartphone based application, not only on demand when people have a craving to smoke, but also at scheduled times throughout the day. And, that, and this has been shown in laboratory settings to be highly effective in reducing temporal discounting and to promote uh, smoking cessation, but it's never been tested in a real world uh, population of uh, older or particularly underserved smokers. Um, why don't we pause here for discussion and then I'll get a bit more into the trial just to the, the, just because the, there may be some questions about EFT or anything else I just mentioned. Uh, there's at least one Q&A but Justin did you have any discussion comments? So one question not related to EFT is uh, in this trial, as well as the e-cigarettes trial, you were offering incentives as an adjunct to pharmacotherapy. And I'm wondering about the potential of incentives to also substitute for the need to say, provide counseling or pharmacotherapy, which would presumably increase cost effectiveness. But the question is maybe around whether that would affect um, efficacy or effectiveness too. And if you have thoughts on sort of that design choice that you've made in those two trials. Yeah. Um, you know, I think this comes down, I'll ask Kevin maybe to, to chime in on this as, as well if he has additional thoughts. Um, so the, the additional trial that Kevin did in 2009 was in the absence of, of background therapy. Um, and I think if you, you know, are comfortable comparing uh, effect sizes across trials, you could imagine that uh, pharmacotherapy may not add very much to incentives, that the incentive arms uh, compared to nothing, triple quit rates and incentives plus pharmacotherapy compared to pharmacotherapy, triples quit rates. It's, it's harder to compare across arms in terms of absolute, uh, I'm sorry, in across trials in terms of absolute cessation rates because the populations of those enrolled are, are so different. Um, so I think it's a, uh, in some ways it's a question of uh, your conceptual model of what ought to work best. And, and it's a timely question to have asked since I advanced to this slide, which shows our conceptual model. Um, we see these three interventions, pharmacotherapy, incentives, and episodic future thinking as combating different barriers uh, to cessation. Free pharmacotherapy should combat the physical craving symptoms of nicotine uh, addiction. Incentives uh, combat the problem that people may, you know, put off till tomorrow what they could do today uh, because it doesn't create, it, can, it creates some immediacy, like this is your opportunity to actually make money from this. And then episodic future thinking um, combats people's difficulty prioritizing the future. So at least conceptually, I would say that using them in combination should work better. Um, but I can't point to a specific evidence base that supports that hypothesis. And just to be clear for EFT, um, has that been tested for other health behavior change um, aside from smoking cessation? I'm, I'm curious. To yeah. Hear, hear Actually, the state of the knowledge there. Yeah. So most of the work uh, on EFT has been done uh, by Len Epstein at the University of Buffalo and Warren Bickle uh, at West Virginia, and almost all of it's in the context of weight loss. Scott, there are a few questions that have come across um, on EFT that I thought might be good for you to answer live. Um, I'm actually having trouble finding them now that I've flagged. Uh, 
Kevin, the answer tab at the bottom. Oh, okay. Uh, so one is the EFT intervention question from Jennifer Cantrell. Doesn't sound that different than cessation text messaging interventions. Is the main difference that it focuses solely on EFT for each message rather than including other domains as well, i.e. mood, managing emotions, et cetera, as most text messaging programs do? I think there are a couple key differences. One is um, in contrast to text messaging programs that are all outgoing, people engage in the process of setting their own cues and what they receive back. That's actually the key innovation and uh, what uh, professors Epstein and Bickle have found is that the actual process of, in, of developing your own cues and thinking about your future health uh, states is, is what accounts for most of the benefit. It's not actually the delivery of the reminders. Okay, and related to that, a question from Max Thomas. Can you measure the magnitude of episodic future thinking or is it just participation in episodic future thinking? Yeah, in, in the behavioral lab uh, studies, they do measure levels of engagement um, in terms of uh, the typical way of measuring it is how many on-demand cues people uh, uh, elect to receive. Uh, the you know the counter argument to doing that is is related to what I just said that if the the theory is that the primary benefit is actually in cue generation itself, then in theory you would measure engagement uh, more by the number of cues that people create rather than by their choices to receive uh, on demand cues back to them. Okay, we have just a few more minutes. I just want everybody to be mindful of the the, the time. All right, there, there's one other question that I didn't get to, but why don't, why don't you go ahead, Scott, and we'll, we'll come back if there's time. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to fast forward. I was going to do a, a bit of a description of explanatory versus pragmatic trials, but it can really wait. This is the schematic uh, of the Corey grant that we'll be launching in a few months. Um, so again, this is an opt-out consent trial. Uh, where people are randomized uh, if they do not opt out uh, to receive those four intervention arms uh, that I mentioned previously. Uh, two of the arms have financial incentives. Arm um, four also has the episodic future thinking. Uh, there are both uh, patient reported outcomes related to anxiety and urge to smoke that are measured as well as uh, biochemical confirmation outcomes that are measured. Uh, it's all done through uh, iPads or smartphones, so it's entirely scalable. Um, and these are some of the pre-specified uh, variables that we'll be controlling for as precision variables in our models, and then um, a number of uh, variables that are pre-specified as potential effect modifiers. I won't dwell on these in the interest of time, but there are, there are a number uh, that are particularly interesting to me uh, and to policymakers. One is the, what the results of lung cancer screening turn out to be. So you can imagine that people who get a, a quote unquote reassuring lung cancer screen, hey, there's nothing in your lungs, good news, and they're smoking, might be less likely to quit smoking. So it actually, uh, could create a, a tension there. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the mere fact of undergoing any form of lung cancer screening creates a forward-looking uh, psychologic state. So you're already uh, thinking about your future. So this could uh, uh, it potentially amplify the benefits of episodic future thinking. Uh, recognizing the time, I'll stop there and, and see if, if there or any more comments or questions? Um, I guess just the last Q&A, are the cues and instructions for engaging in EFT culturally tailored for participants from underserved backgrounds? The, um, the way we are implementing this in our trial is we have a, uh, uh, a large stakeholder advisory committee that includes um, some uh, local Philadelphia-based and national groups that are uh, uh, very active in Latino health, 
uh, African American health. Uh, we have uh, leaders from health systems that are part of the stakeholder advisory group. We have leaders in health literacy. Uh, and all of our uh, communication materials uh, that are designed for patients in this study, whether they're the EFT materials or any of the surveys, have all been vetted and pilot tested among uh, this diverse stakeholder advisory committee. Uh, we are out of time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Halpern, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussions. Finally, thank you to the audience of more than 100 people for your participation. Our next seminar speaker is Armando Mayer from the University of Lausanne. Uh, on November 13th, um, his presentation title is Tobacco Sales Prohibition and Teen Smoking. After leaving the seminar, you will have an opportunity to complete a survey on your satisfaction with the seminar today. We appreciate the feedback. You will also receive an email with instructions for how you can receive a certificate for your attendance today. Thanks again for participating and have a top snow weekend. Thank you all. Thank you.